All right. Got people filtering in. All right, so we have a couple things to address. All right, so we have exam on Friday. All right, all right, exam on Friday. So we won't have class. I'll just come up here. Uh, if you want to take your exam here, uh, I'll stick around. Uh, if no one shows up, I'll just head right back to my office. So you can, <clears throat> just so you're aware of that. All right. That exam, I probably have to make an announcement on Blackboard about this, but that exam will go live sometime early in the morning, probably about 5 in the morning. Uh, you have to have started it by 11.30. It's more than enough time. You know it's coming. You know the test was going to be available. You plan for it, all right? Uh, in those in that evening on Friday, I won't be around. I won't I won't have access to email. So you've got all day to do it. Once you start it, the timer starts. And I don't know how long it's going to be. I think that that's going to be what what I'll I'll send an email uh, once I once I have finalized it and know how many questions are on the test. I'll tell you how you know how how much time you have. I will also include that in the description so that you can see it before you start. So you have to know exactly how many questions there's going to be that there is on that exam and how long you have. Uh, estimate is about 60 to 90 seconds per question. All right. True false questions really only need about 30 seconds. You should be able to read it and have an answer. All right. But because we have mul these multiple answer questions. Uh, you generally allow a little bit more time, all right? Generally allow a little bit more time on those than 60 seconds. Uh, on this exam, <clears throat> it isn't, we don't have fill in the blanks. It's all going to be either true, false, multiple choice, or multiple answers. You will recognize the multiple answers because you can select more than one answer. And, all, and on all of those, you select as many as you think are correct. All right, multiple choice. There are some where I did did say no, we are going to have just straight up multiple choice questions. So, you know, we talk about the lab and we say if we violated this assumption of the Lincoln-Peterson index, is uh, you know, is our actual estimate higher, lower? You know, how does our our actual how does our estimate compare to the actual? And I'll have something like lower. Uh, no change or higher or something like that. That's going to be a multiple choice question because you can't pick like both lower and higher. All right, so you'll, you'll know those. The other thing about this test that, that's a bit different uh, is that you'll get one question at a time. And that's why it's important that I'm going to tell you how many questions are on there so you can keep track. All right, so you'll get one, one question at a time. Make sure you have solid internet connection when you start it. Uh, should have more than enough time to complete the test, especially if you've uh, studied and reviewed the material. If you chose not to review and study, and you went in thinking, yeah, I'll be able to look this stuff up, you will run out of time. You will not finish that exam. Simple as that. All right? So if you have questions, you can feel free to email me. Uh, we did have quizzes that, that were going to be due. Uh, when I get back to my office, I'll make sure that all of those quizzes, those last two quizzes, 5.1, 5.2, they get released today. Uh, so that way you can look at the questions, you can look at the answers, use that to study. Our lab that's on there is the biodiversity stuff. Make sure you know those variables. Make sure you know like what the values mean, you know, how to compare the values too. All right. And also mark recapture. Those are the two things that, that are on our lab, or that, that will be. Those are the labs 
that are on this exam. All right. So did anyone have questions over the material that will be on the exam? I didn't receive any, any emails at all, so yes, no? All right. If we don't, we're going to move ahead. All right, so we did evolutionary ecology, and believe it or not, you're going to see evolutionary ecology throughout the, the rest of this course. All right, just can't. You can't separate evolution and ecology. They just go hand in hand, all right? We talked about physiological ecology. Uh, and what we've talked about is this intraspecific variation. We've talked about environmental variation. All of this goes to what this next section is, is all about, and it's on populations, all right? How do we describe populations? This presentation, we're, we're gonna focus on size and dispersion patterns, all right? So, when we talk about a population, we're interested in describing it and usually describing it quantitatively. This is what demography is. All right? So demography is a quantitative description of a population and its characteristics. All right? This field, demography, if you're interested in demographics, you're interested in, in knowing how populations grow and how populations change. It's not just about changes in the population size. It's also about changes in, let's say, age structure of a population, changes in sex ratios, changes in birth rates and death rates and so forth. All right? Demography is just the generic, trying to quantitatively describe a population and its characteristics. All right? And it's part of ecology. Oftentimes, ecologists are interested in this. Now, what is a population? We've defined this before. We've got to define it again. So a population is simply a group of individuals of the same species that inhabit a particular area. All right. Same species, they inhabit a particular area. And what this particular area means is that we have to have our individuals be able to interact with each other. They don't necessarily have to randomly mate, but they have to have some sort of interaction, either directly or indirectly, in order for us to form a population. In many cases, we can arbitrarily define our prop populations, say a population of skunks here in San Angelo, uh, or we can, you know, if that's too specific, we can increase it and say, well, we're going to deal with skunks in Texas. Is it possible that skunks in El Paso are interacting with skunks in Beaumont? Probably not, but they do have inter the indirect interaction, so they may be interacting with individuals along the way, all right? So it's very important that we actually define our area when dealing with populations. In some cases, we're gonna separate our populations. They can be separated based on our arbitrary distinction, maybe geographical distinction. Sometimes we'll separate them based on their demographic characteristics. Now, when we have these distinctions though, our populations could be connected in some way. They could be connected by dispersal. All right? And this is the, the idea of connectivity. Connectivity is, describes that link between two or more populations by dispersal, of an by dispersal of individuals. If we have high connectivity between our populations, it means we have a, high, a large amount of movement, a large amount of gene flow happening between our populations. If we have low connectivity, we have a low amount of gene flow between our populations. So in general, highly connected populations are going to be more similar than those that exhibit low connectivity. So here's a question, kind of prep you for the exam. What is the effect of this connectivity on the FST values? We we introduce FSTs on Monday, right? This is Wright's F statistic. How does this affect our FSTs? If we have a population and all of a sudden the connectivity increases, what is that gonna do to the FST values? Does it increase, decrease, or no change? What do you say? What do you say? 
Increase, decrease, no change. Okay, we had an increase here. Who votes for that? Okay, who votes for no change? Yep, so if we have a population and the connectivity increases, what happens to our FST value? So we have a decrease. Who says decrease? That's it. Okay, who says no increase? And who says increase? All right, so it looks like we've got decrease. So yeah, FST measures that separation between our populations, and if we have a lot of gene flow, we homogenize our populations, make them less different, which means our FSTs are gonna go down. So there's a reason why we, we introduce these rights F statistics. They tell us a little bit about this connectivity. If we have low values, it's possible that our populations are highly connected. If we have high values of this FST, it may mean that our populations are not connected. Do you have a question? All right. All right, so we've got connectivity. We also have these population boundaries defining our areas. All right. And it's important to define these boundaries because our individuals are not homogeneously distributed across our landscape. They're going to exist as perhaps subpopulations. So we could have maybe a large population, and they're going to be fragmented. Kind of an important that's an important idea for, for rights shifting balance theory, right? Kind of link back to one of those first things that we talked about on an exam one. Right. Or it could, these could actually be separate populations with limited connectivity between them. But what we do know is that individuals aren't just evenly distributed. They're going to exist in, in these patches. Now normally our boundaries, you know, where we would cut off our populations, are determined by geographical differences. All right, oftentimes. So take this picture. You can very clearly see we have some, what's labeled as old growth forest. So this is kind of late successional stage forests. All right. We have two patches of those and we have a stream going through. So if we were looking at anything that, that can't really fly and traverse a river, well, we've got two different patches here. We have a young forest early in successional stage. All right, that's separated from uh, from the old growth by a ravine on one side and by a river on another. Uh, we have agricultural fields and then we have a, a isolated forest patch. So geographically, we have clear separations between these different forest habitats. And even within the forest habitats, we have some young, young growth forests and we have some old growth forests there. All right, so we have natural geographic distinctions that could allow us to properly define populations. But, the other, but that's only part of the story. Sometimes we're going to define our populations based on their demographic characteristics. That could be the number of individuals that we see, or the density, I should say. Density is probably the better descriptor. So based on the density, perhaps some patches have higher density than other patches. That could mean that we have two different populations in those patches could be related to spatial distribution, spatial dispersion in a landscape. That's a focus of our labs this week and next week. Could be reproductive rates, could be uh, degree of connectivity, could be age structure, could be sex ratios, could be a lot of different things, all relating to these uh, different patches. So the example that we have here, and the reason why we have this figure, is white-footed mice. All right? We have distinct populations. All right? And they live in these patches. You've got the old growth forest, young forest, forest patches, and so forth. And they are a forest. They're going to be a forest species. Yeah, the, occasionally they'll venture into the ravine. Occasionally they'll venture out into the agricultural fields uh, to feed. But normally you're going to find them in the forests. Now we could define our populations based on these patches themselves. But we also see that based on the patches, we get different demographics. So if we look at the old growth forest, our population numbers are actually much less than those individuals in the young forests or 
in the young force or the force actually the young force is the successional force that's what that is the force patch has a higher population size than the old growth force so right there that tells you we're going to have a higher density in that force patch for some reason than in our old growth force and the young force is something a little bit different we don't see the population of these things year round instead what we see is population increase and in peak towards you know late summer and then it drops off now is this successional force is this young force represent an actual population yeah probably probably and we'll learn about meta populations and that's probably what what this is uh, at least partly in meta population dynamics but you can see that we have different demographic characters characteristics based on where they survive or where they live so it's not just the area but it's also going to be our uh, demographic characteristics Now this brings us to an important concept. It's the distinction between an ecological population and an evolutionary population. So we can say population is a group of individuals in a, in a defined area, but we can get a little bit more specific and really separate them out between an ecological population, which is that population that lives in the area, and an evolutionary population, which is the population that lives in the area and actually takes part in random mating. All right. So our ecological population, they don't, not every single individual has to take part in, in random mating. They don't have to. It's that skunks in Texas, all right? They're not going to take a part in random mating. Those skunks in, in El Paso are not randomly mating with the skunks in Beaumont. It's just unlikely. Unlikely. It's not possible. They're too far away, all right? So that's an ecological population. They're in that area. We've defined our boundaries arbitrarily in, in our example by the this, this state of Texas, by the state boundaries. All right? But a lot of times, a more realistic description is that we're going to define our populations uh, by some, something ecologically relevant. So on the previous slide, it could be the old growth force, and it could be the boundary of the force. It could be the boundary of our young force and so forth. All right, so normally in an ecological bound, uh, population, we've defined our area based on some sort of ecologically relevant change in our environment. And what's important is that these individuals, they don't have to randomly mate. Yeah, they have to interact in some way, but that interaction could be, could be an indirect type of interaction. Evolutionary populations, on the other hand, are defined by a deem. All right, a deem is a group of randomly mating individuals. So our evolutionary population consists of only those individuals that are taking part in random mating. Why is random mating important? What's that? So, mm, why is randomly mating important? genetic variation and what concept had an assumption that our individuals are randomly mating Hardy Weinberg all right so yeah Hardy Weinberg also had the gene flow probably it's your that's going through your your head so yeah we talked about Hardy Weinberg equilibrium we talked about changes in our population one of those assumptions is that our population is randomly mating that population that is randomly mating is called a deem it's a group of randomly mating individuals. Now, the boundaries of that are going to be de determined by the barriers to mating and gene flow. So we want anything that's going to block the gene flow now starts to block off the, the possibility of randomly mating with individuals. All right? And anything that's going to block the, the ability to randomly mate will now start to cause us to form our boundaries of that evolutionary population. Now it's called evolutionary population because this is the population on which evolution acts. Remember evolution acts at population levels. It's not going to act on our individual. All right, we see the change at the population level and the population that it actually acts on is this evolutionary population or more specifically it's going to act on our deem. 
it's going to act on that group of individuals that are randomly mating. Now, if we have an effect on that, if we change our, our DEEM, if we change that evolutionary population, then we can change the ecological population. So they're not just like two separate ideas. Do you have a question? That is, so it's a pot, it's a ecological, all of the individuals there and the evolutionary is just those that, that are mating. Yeah, it, it's a lot. So I do have board, see the board for clarification. That was my note to say, let's clarify this. So get this in just a little bit. So here's our example. I'm going to use an island because the islands kind of represent arbitrarily or very arbitrary boundaries okay so what we could say is we have an island all right and we're interested in let's say I don't know tortoises or something like that all right we've got a bit we'll say a big mountain in the middle so any of our individuals if they're on this side of the island they can't cross so what we can have are groups of individuals that live on our island. So in this case, I'm going to label these. Whoops. Why did I do two C's? A, B, C, N, D. A, B, C, and D. All right, so our island, what we've done is, is set up areas where we have four different groups living. All right, group A, group B, group C, group D, they're all the same species. All right, we could define our population as the population on the island. But what we notice in this group is that our individuals, they can't cross over the island to get to, to the other groups. All right? That's not possible. The only way to kind of get to the other groups is to go through the ocean. All right? And what we could do is kind of set up different, different barriers to the gene flow that kind of limits what we're going to see. So you know, maybe we have reefs, rocky outcroppings. It's not suitable habitat for individuals but it also presents gene flow. So our ecological population in this case could be all of these tortoises that are on the island. That's our ecological population, but we know that those from D and B, they're not randomly mating. They could be interacting because they're affecting, let's say, food supplies with the adjacent individuals. That's an indirect interaction with each other. All right, so we have our ecological population here, but then our evolutionary populations would be these patches, these groups that don't really cross. They, don't have, they have very limited gene flow with the other patches, with the other subpopulations. All right, and our random mating is going to be occurring in those spots. All right, If we change, if we have evolution happening here, in C, maybe that is a change in, let's say, birth rates, reproductive outputs. That's going to change the average reproductive output of our ecological population. So they're not mutually exclusive. All right? Make sense? So this is kind of like our idea. All right? This is, this is the idea. Social organisms, you know, organisms that live in social groups, uh, tend to exhibit something similar where you go out to a field, go out to an area, you have the large group, you have multiple groups there. Um, random mating may only be occurring within the groups themselves. So the group is the evolutionary population, but that entire area that had multiple groups could be defined as our ecological population. All right. So what we're going to focus on, we're not really going to separate ecological and evolutionary populations much. 
But if you're curious what we're, what we're going to talk about, we're just going to, we're going to talk about probably the evolutionary populations. But all of these ideas going forward also apply to the ecological populations. All right. So once we're, we've defined our populations, and let's say we are focused on evolutionary populations, how do we describe them? Well, there's three fundamental descriptors of our populations, and we're going to address all three of these fundamental descriptors. Fundamental descriptor number one is the number of individuals in our population. All right. This is just a straight number of individuals, but usually we report it as a density. So we account for the area. The second fundamental descriptor, so we did mark recapture, the grasshopper stuff, that focused on the number of individuals. That focused on our first fundamental descriptor. Our second fundamental descriptor is what we're doing this week and next week, and that is spatial dispersion. All right? This is the distribution of our individuals across a landscape. Do they, these individuals occur randomly? Are they clumped? Are they a uniform distribution? How are they distributed across our landscape throughout our, how are they distributed in our habitat? Then our third fundamental descriptor that we're going to talk about are the demographic characteristics. This will be the lab after our spatial dispersion. So this will be two weeks. We're going to deal with demographic characteristics. All right. The demographic characteristics that we'll talk about here in lecture are age structure, sex ratios, and birth rates, among other things. All right, so we can talk about death rates. That kind of leads to our age structure. Age structure. Um, that's kind of why I left that off. What we're going to talk about today and probably finish up on Monday is number of individuals and spatial dispersion. All right, so number, descriptor number one, number of individuals. This is basically our population size. That's what it is. How many individuals exist in our population? We abbreviate population size with capital letter N. All right, capital letter N. And I use the subscript T to say this is population size at time T. And this kind of tells us that our population size can change depending on when we look at it. So we can look at it today and we, that we have a population size. We can look at it tomorrow and the population size can change. If we go out and did the grasshoppers, let's say, in another two weeks, I bet our population size changes. I bet our population size changes. Now, the population size is a, somewhat of limited use. Um, because it doesn't really tell us about a lot of the interactions that, that could happen. Yeah, it does, could inform us about some things, but it doesn't, so it could inform us about things like genetic drift. Is genetic drift going to be important or not? But in terms of population growth, population regulation, interactions, intraspecific interactions that are happening, number really isn't the, the end-all, be-all of our descriptor because we could be working with a, very, with, with a very large area, we could be working with a very small area. So if we dealt with grasshoppers, a thousand, we estimated between about 1,000 and 1,400 grasshoppers uh, out in that gra grassy area. All right. Say 1,000 grasshoppers in that grass area is very different, has very different processes than 1,000 grasshoppers in the entire Red Arroyo, right? Very different, very different meaning. And it's very different meaning than if we said we had a thousand grasshoppers in our little grass area that over here, where we did our where we did or will be doing the ragweed distributions. Alright? So population size, yeah, it helps us look at population growths, but the meaning, how important that size is, isn't meaningful until we take into account the the entire area. And for that now we can talk about densities. All right, so density is just simply the number of individuals per unit area. All right, and in, in ecology, we can reference the crude density, or we can refer to an ecological density. Now, of these two, ecological density is probably more meaningful. 
because crude density is simply the number of individuals per unit area. When you think about density, a lot of people think about crude density. But then other people, let's say, into, let's say over at uh, the ag department, you know, when you're thinking about grassland management, you're thinking about the, you know, the, cat, the, the, the cattle industry or the, the you know, sheep industry. They're probably thinking more along the lines of ecological density because they know, they recognize that they need a certain acreage to support each head of cattle. cattle all right? And the acreage that's important is suitable habitat, appropriate habitat. And that's our ecological density. All right, so here's an example. You have a ranch, it's 10 acres, just so you can see it. Here's a 10 acre ranch. You were big in geometry, so you made it very square. No. Lighten it up a little bit, right? All right. So 10 acre ranch, but in our ranch we have a five acre lake. All right, five acre lake. If we have, let's say, five deer on this land, all right, our crude density is five deer out of that 10 acres, or we have half a deer per acre. That's our crude density. But we know the deer aren't going to be living in this water. They, they don't walk on water. So the better density estimate is an ecological density. So if this lake was five acres, that means there's only five acres of usable land or appropriate habitat in this ranch. So that means our density now goes from half a deer per acre to one deer per acre. Five deers per five acres of usable habitat. All right, so ecological density is going to be the more useful term to us in most cases. Now, why is density important? Because it really gives us a better representation of what might be happening at our population levels. Many of our ecological processes are influenced by this density. Things like density-dependent regulation that we'll talk about in population growth. You know, uh, aggression levels might be dependent on densities. Right? Higher the density, the more aggressive individuals are. The, more, the higher the density, the more competition is felt with our individuals. All of those things, it's tied more to density than to simply the population size. The higher the density, the more likely you might have inbreeding, too. All right. So how do we measure our population sizes? It kind of depends on the organism that we're interested in. All right. So if we're interested in an organism that is discrete, so individuals clearly seen, clearly marked, an individual that is very conspicuous, easy to find, easy to see, and it's an organism that has very limited mobility, doesn't move around a lot, then you can do a total census. Trees, great example of that. I can go out and we can go out and count every tree on campus, and we can have a very good count of the trees. Why? Because they don't move. We can go out there and we can put, it, we, you know, we can put a spray paint mark on it and say, we've counted this, all right? In, if, if, if we have multiple people out there counting, all right? So total census, you can do that. You can go out and count some of these individuals. But it's not really going to be, it's not going to be good if we don't have discrete individuals. So if we have growth that's like vegetative growth, all right, it's going to be hard to kind of count an individual because you don't know where one individual ends and one individual begins, all right? You don't know that. Grasses, the Bermuda grass, kind of spreads vegetatively. It's kind of difficult. Some of the uh, ferns and mosses in forests have underground roots. It's kind of hard to identify them. Which, what's the individual and what's just vegetative growth of one individual? Also, if the organism's hard to find, it's going to be hard to count them. All right, nighttime. You know, organisms that are active at night are going to be hard to find. Camouflage individuals are going to be a lot harder to find, uh, as well as highly mobile organisms. 
right? We couldn't go out and just count every single grasshopper out there because you catch a grasshopper and you let it go and it's moving all over the place. All right, so total census isn't good for any of those things. And that means we have to do some other estimates, other ways to approximate n. One of the ways that we did in lab is this mark recapture experiment. All right, this is really good for discrete individuals and it's pretty good for mobile organisms as well. We capture them, we put a mark on them, we let them go, we come back at a later time, capture them. Based on the proportion of individuals that had been recaptured in that, that sample period, we can approximate our population size. We use the Lincoln Index to do that, but we also introduce that Schnabel method. And there are several other different methods that, do, that will calculate the same thing. And a lot of them are based on this Lincoln Index, where you have the individual marked at the beginning, divided by our total population size at the beginning. Uh, and this ratio is equal to the ratio of marked individuals, R, to our total captures. And then you rearrange it and you get our estimate. All right, we did this in lab. All right, know how to do it. Know the assumptions of it. Right, know how to use it. Know why we use it. All right. Other times, our organisms are going to be hard to find. And for that, and, and sometimes those organisms, maybe even if, if they are easy to find, sometimes we might not be interested or we might not have a need to know an exact number. Maybe it's more important just to know, do we have more this year than last year? And for that, we can calculate something called the index of relative abundance. And I put these terms, these words, these phrases in red for a reason, because this kind of tells us how we calculate the index of relative abundance. One, we don't have to see the individual. All that we're looking for is evidence that the individuals are there. All right? And the more evidence we see, the more likely we have more individuals in that area. And note that I just said more. I didn't give a number. I didn't say, oh, I saw more evidence, so we must have 100 more. No, we don't know that. All that we can say is if the evidence increases, we probably have more individuals present. If the evidence decreases, we probably have less individuals present. Now, what type of evidence are we looking for? Give me an example of the evidence. If we, we're going to go out and we're going to try to get one of these index of relative abundance of an organism that's very hard to find, very hard to catch. What kind of evidence are we looking for? What's that? Poop. Scat. Yeah, definitely. Scat. Go out there and look for that. The more you see, the more individuals that are probably there. What other evidence? What's that? And tracks. Tracks. Right? Evidence that they're there. Right? Rubs. You know, for, for deer. We're getting into that deer season. Uh, also, what, what do we do with birds? What's that? Who's, who, what, what's ornithology in the spring, fall? When was it? Last semester? Oh, man, so you guys only got half a semester? Because then it was online, right? Oh, that's a bummer. You guys might not, did you guys go out and do birding? All right, what did you do? You, so you did miss nets, that's a capture. Did you? go out and just kind of find birds through the binoculars? Did you listen to their calls? So listening to, to the calls is the other indirect evidence. All right? You know they're there because they're making the calls, but you might not have seen them. And especially if you get a good ear, and, I, and I'm sure Dr. Skipper had you learning the different calls, right? If you hear them, you can identify the species, and that gives us a re relative abundance. It could be one individual. But the more you hear, the more likely there, there's more individuals. I'll do this next, next spring. Next spring. I'll listen out at the arroyo. As the weather warms up, as the nights warm up, we'll st I'll start hearing the frogs out there, start hearing the cricket frogs. All right? Sometimes you'll hear the bullfrogs. Right? I don't know how many are out there, but just based on how frequent I hear the calls and how many different calls, that's our index of relative abundance. All right, so 
This relative abundance is a quantitative measure of the relative size of a population using indirect evidence of the presence or absence of individuals. And again, it's useful when our individuals are difficult to count or where we don't, where our population size doesn't really matter. So those of you interested in conservation, uh, you have a land and you're trying to rehabilitate it, all right, you, you need to get a population estimate before you start. Is the actual number important? Not necessarily, because what you're hoping for is once you implement the conservation measures, you're hoping that the populations increase. And this is where the relative abundance comes into play. Yep. Banding is a form of mark recapture. All right. Spatial dispersion. This is what we're doing this week. All right. So I think what we're going to do is just kind of give you the, the brief introduction. Some of you have had lab already. All right. Some of you have lab today and tomorrow. So dispersion is a pattern of spatial distribution of a species in a habitat. Do not confuse dispersion with dispersal. All right. Dispersal is the movement away from our natal area. Dispersion is their spatial pattern. Now, when we talk about dispersion, we have three patterns. And what you can do is think about them as being on a scale, as a continuum. At one extreme, we have a uniform or regular distribution pattern. At the opposite extreme, we have a clumped or aggregated distribution pattern. And right in the middle is the random distribution pattern. Now, th these spatial patterns, those of you that have been in my stats class all right, should recognize that this dist distribution pattern follows a, what's called a Poisson distribution. It's a probability distribution. And the important thing about this, distri this probability distribution is that the mean and the variances are equal. So if we follow a Poisson distribution, this is a random distribution, random distribution, our mean and our variance are equal. They're the same value. So what we can do is calculate a ratio, a variance to mean ratio. Take the variance of our population divided by the mean of our population to get a term called the coefficient of dispersion. All right? If our coefficient of dispersion is one, it means our variance and the mean are equal. And that suggests then that our population, our species, is randomly distributed across our landscape. As our variance and our means change, we become less and less random. We become less and less random. And if we're less and less random, that means something other than random is affecting our population, some other process. And usually, it's going to be a biological process. So a uniform or regular pattern is when our individuals seem to be equally spaced, or approximately equally spaced. In this situation, our coefficient of dispersion is going to be less than 1. The variance, the variability in our distances is very low, because basically all of our individuals are spaced equally. An orchard. This is a great example of a uniform regular distribution. This is human derived. We did that. All right. Go to Christmas tree farms, uniform random dis dispersion pattern. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end is this clumped or aggregated distribution pattern. In this case, our individuals are close together. They form groups. Our coefficient of dispersion in this case is going to be greater than 1. All right, so our variances, we have some distances that are really, really small because they're close together. And then we have some distances that are really large. So all of these are really far away from these. So we don't have really uniformity in those distances anymore. And thus, it's going to drive our variance higher than our average, which gives us a coefficient of dispersion greater than 1. All right, so I had a question. How common is it to have the uniform dispersion that hasn't been caused by humans? It's not very common, all right? As we'll learn that the most common type of pattern is this clumped or aggregated pattern, 
All right. Most common pattern is clumped or aggregated, but we do see random and we do see uniform and regular dispersion patterns in nature. All right. Oftentimes, they're due to different processes. So that's on our next slide. We'll kind of start going through what can produce these patterns. And I think what we'll do is we'll pick that up on Monday. So we'll kind of do a quick review. And I think Monday's going to be a pretty good introduction to our lab, to the data analysis part of our lab that we'll do next week. All right. So don't forget, exam on Friday goes off at 5. You have to start it by 1130 at night. You got more than enough time. Don't, you shouldn't be emailing me, asking me for more time because you've got all day. We've known about it uh, for this exam, all right? We've known about it. And what's different, we don't have a word list for our definitions, all right? All of our definitions, those are multiple choice. So I, I say what term describes, here's the, the definition, and then I give you choice of four words, all right? That's for our definition. And you're going to be presented one question at a time. And it's different. All right, so instead of getting the entire, entire exam, what the heck? Hold on. Yeah, I'm not moving. I'm not moving. Right? There it is. Oh, figures. All right. Anyways, I guess that's our, our, our my, that was my uh, hook to get me off the stage. So, yep. Can you go back to a question? Uh, no, probably, nope, nope. So when you get the question, go through it. Anywhere from 60 to 90 seconds per question. So some of the questions you'll be able to kind of cruise through it, you know the answer right away. Other questions will be slow. And that's why I'm gonna tell you how many questions I have in the overall time limit so that you can kind of keep track yourself of, of how many more you, you have. All right, and I don't have any questions on there that are multiple parts. Each question would be just one answer. All right. Oh, Kyle asked 5 p.m. No, 5 a.m. in the morning. If you want to take it first thing in the morning. All right. <laughs>